Introductory Note of The Journal of John Woolman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devin Pertz. The Journal of John Woolman by John Woolman. Introductory Note. John Woolman was born at Northampton, New Jersey in 1720 and died at York, England in 1772. He was the child of Quaker parents, and from his youth was a zealous member of the Society of Friends. His journal, published posthumously in 1774, sufficiently describes his way of life and the spirit in which he did his work, but his extreme humility prevents him from making clear the importance of the part he played in the movement against slaveholding among the Quakers. During the earlier years of their settlement in America, the friends took part in the traffic in slaves with apparently as little hesitation as their fellow colonists. But in 1671, George Fox, visiting the Barbados, was struck by the inconsistency of slaveholding with the religious principles of his society. His protests, along with those of others, led to the growth of an agitation which spread from section to section. In 1742, Woolman, then a young clerk in the employment of a storekeeper in New Jersey, was asked to make out a bill of sale for a negro woman, and the scruples which then occurred to him were the beginning of a lifelong activity against the traffic. Shortly afterward he began his laborious foot journeys, pleading everywhere with his co-religionists and inspiring others to take up the crusade. The result of the agitation was that the various yearly meetings one by one, decided that emancipation was a religious duty, and within twenty years after Woolman's death, the practice of slavery had ceased in the Society of Friends. But his influence did not stop there, for no small part of the enthusiasm of the general emancipation movement is traceable to his labors. His own words in this journal, of an extraordinary simplicity and charm, are the best expression of a personality which in its ardor, purity of motive, breadth of sympathy, and clear spiritual insight gives woman a place among the uncanonized saints of America. End of introductory note. Recording by Devin Pertz, El Paso, Texas. Chapter 1 of The Journal of John Woolman by John Woolman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devin Pertz. Chapter 1, 1720-1742. His birth and parentage, some account of the operations of divine grace on his mind in his youth, his first appearance in the ministry, and his considerations while young on the keeping of slaves. I have often felt a motion of love to leave some hints in writing of my experience of the goodness of God, and now, in the thirty-sixth year of my age, I begin this work. I was born in Northampton, in Burlington County, West Jersey, in the year 1720. Before I was seven years old, I began to be acquainted with the operations of divine love. Through the care of my parents, I was taught to read nearly as soon as I was capable of it. And as I went from school one day, I remember that while my companions were playing by the way, I went forward out of sight, and, sitting down, I read the twenty-second chapter of Revelation. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb and others. In reading it, my mind was drawn to seek after that pure habitation which I then believed God had prepared for his servants. The place where I sat, and the sweetness that attended my mind, remained fresh in my memory. This, and the like gracious visitations, had such an effect upon me that when boys used ill language it troubled me, and, through the continued mercies of God, I was preserved from that evil. The pious instructions of my parents were often fresh in my mind when I happened to be among wicked children and were of use to me. Having a large family of children, they used frequently, on first days after meeting, to set us one after another to read the holy scriptures or some religious books the rest sitting by without much conversation. I have since often thought it was a good practice. From what I had read and heard, I believe there had been, in past ages, people who walked in uprightness before God in a degree exceeding any that I knew or heard of now living. 
and the apprehension of there being less steadiness and firmness amongst people in the present age often troubled me while I was a child. I may here mention a remarkable circumstance that occurred in my childhood. On going to a neighbor's house, I saw on the way a robin sitting on her nest, and as I came near she went off, but having young ones, she flew about, and with many cries expressed her concern for them. I stood and threw stones at her, and one striking her, she fell down dead. At first I was pleased with the exploit, but after a few minutes was seized with horror at having, in a sportive way, killed an innocent creature while she was careful for her young. I beheld her lying dead, and thought those young ones, for which she was so careful, must now perish for want of their dam to nourish them. After some painful considerations on the subject, I climbed up the tree, took all the young birds, and killed them, supposing that better than to leave them to pine away and die miserably. In this case, I believed that scripture proverb was fulfilled, the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. I then went on my errand, and for some hours could think of little else but the cruelties I had committed, and was much troubled. Thus, he whose tender mercies are over all his works hath placed a principle in the human mind, which incites to exercise goodness towards every living creature, and this being singly attended to, people became tender-hearted and sympathizing. But when frequently and totally rejected, the mind becomes shut up in a contrary disposition. About the twelfth year of my age, my father being abroad, my mother reproved me for some misconduct to which I made an undutiful reply. The next first day, as I was with my father returning from meeting, he told me that he understood I had behaved amiss to my mother and advised me to be more careful in the future. I knew myself blamable, and in shame and confusion remained silent. Being thus awakened to a sense of my wickedness, I felt remorse in my mind, and on getting home I retired and prayed to the Lord to forgive me, and I do not remember that I ever afterwards spoke unhandsomely to either of my parents, however foolish, and some other things. Having attained the age of sixteen years, I began to love wanton company, and though I was preserved from profane language or scandalous conduct, yet I perceived a plant in me which produced much wild grapes. My merciful father did not, however, forsake me utterly, but at times, through his grace, I was brought seriously to consider my ways, and the sight of my backslidings affected me with sorrow, yet for want of rightly attending to the reproofs of instruction, vanity was added to vanity, and repentance to repentance. Upon the whole, my mind became more and more alienated from the truth, and I hastened toward destruction. While I meditate on the gulf toward which I traveled, and reflect on my youthful disobedience, for these things I weep, mine eye runneth down with water. Advancing in age, the number of my acquaintance increased, and thereby my way grew more difficult. Though I had found comfort in reading the holy scriptures and thinking on heavenly things, I was now estranged therefrom. I knew I was going from the flock of Christ and had no resolution to return, hence serious reflections were uneasy to me, and youthful vanities and diversions were my greatest pleasure. In this road I found many like myself, and we associated in that which is averse to true friendship. In this swift race it pleased God to visit me with sickness, so that I doubted of recovery, then did darkness, horror, and amazement with full force seize me, even when my pain and distress of body were very great. I thought it would have been better for me never to have had being, than to see the day which I now saw. I was filled with confusion, and in great affliction, both of mind and body, I lay and bewailed myself. I had not confidence to lift up my cries to God, whom I had thus offended, but in a deep sense of my great folly I was humbled before him. At length that word which is as a fire and a hammer broke and dissolved my rebellious heart. My cries were put up in contrition, and in the multitude of his mercies I found inward relief and a close engagement that if he was pleased to restore my health I might walk humbly before him. After my recovery this exercise remained with me a considerable time, 
but by degrees giving way to youthful vanities and associating with wanton young people, I lost ground. The Lord had been very gracious and spoke peace to me in the time of my distress, and I now most ungratefully turned again to folly. At times I felt sharp reproof, but I did not get low enough to cry for help. I was not so hardy as to commit things scandalous, but to exceed in vanity and to promote mirth was my chief study. Still I retained a love and esteem for pious people, and their company brought an awe upon me. My dear parents several times admonished me in the fear of the Lord, and their admonition entered into my heart and had a good effect for a season, but not getting deep enough to pray rightly, the tempter, when he came, found entrance. Once, having spent a part of the day in wantonness, when I went to bed at night, there lay in a window near my bed a Bible, which I opened, and first cast my eye on the text, We lie down in our shame, and our confusion covereth us. This I knew to be my case, and meeting with so unexpected a reproof, I was somewhat affected with it, and went to bed under remorse of conscience, when I soon cast off again. Thus time passed on, my heart was replenished with mirth and wantonness, while pleasing scenes of vanity were presented to my imagination, till I attained the age of eighteen years, near which time I felt the judgments of God in my soul like a consuming fire, and looking over my past life the prospect was moving. I was often sad, and longed to be delivered from those vanities, then again my heart was strongly inclined to them, and there was in me a sore conflict. At times I turned to folly, and then again sorrow and confusion took hold of me. In a while I resolved totally to leave off some of my vanities, but there was a secret reserve in my heart of the more refined part of them, and I was not low enough to find true peace. Thus for some months I had great troubles. My will was unsubjected, which rendered my labors fruitless. At length, through the merciful continuance of heavenly visitations, I was made to bow down in spirit before the Lord. One evening I had spent some time in reading a pious author, and walking out alone I humbly prayed to the Lord for his help, that I might be delivered from all those vanities which so ensnared me. Thus being brought low, he helped me, and as I learned to bear the cross I felt refreshment to come from his presence but not keeping in that strength which gave victory, I lost ground again, the sense of which greatly affected me. I sought deserts and lonely places, and there with tears did confess my sins to God, and humbly craved his help. And I may say with reverence, he was near to me in my troubles, and in those times of humiliation opened my ear to discipline. I was now led to look seriously at the means by which I was drawn from the pure truth, and learn that if I would live such a life as the faithful servants of God lived, I must not go into company as heretofore in my own will, but all the cravings of sense must be governed by a divine principle. In times of sorrow and abasement these instructions were sealed upon me, and I felt the power of Christ prevail over selfish desires, so that I was preserved in a good degree of steadiness, and being young, and believing at the time that a single life was best for me, I was strengthened to keep from such company as had often been a snare to me. I kept steadily to meetings, spent first day afternoons chiefly in reading the scriptures and other good books, and was early convinced in my mind that true religion consisted in an inward life, wherein the heart does love and reverence God the Creator, and learns to exercise true justice and goodness, not only toward all men, but also toward the brute creatures, that, as the mind was moved by an inward principle to love God as an invisible, incomprehensible being, so, by the same principle, it was moved to love him in all his manifestations in the visible world, that, as by his breath the flame of life was kindled in all animal sensible creatures, to say we love God as unseen, and at the same time exercise cruelty toward the least creature moving by his life, or by life derived from him, was a contradiction in itself. I found no narrowness respecting sex and opinions, but believed that sincere, upright-hearted people in every society who truly love God were accepted of him, 
as I lived under the cross and simply followed the opening of truth, my mind from day to day was more enlightened. My former acquaintance were left to judge of me as they would, for I found it safest for me to live in private and keep these things sealed up in my own breast. While I silently ponder on that change wrought in me, I find no language equal to convey to another a clear idea of it. I looked upon the works of God in this visible creation, and an awfulness covered me. My heart was tender and often contrite, and universal love to my fellow creatures increased in me. This will be understood by such as have trodden in the same path. Some glances of real beauty may be seen in their faces who dwell in true meekness. There is a harmony in the sound of that voice to which divine love gives utterance, and some appearance of right order in their tempter and conduct whose passions are regulated, yet these do not fully show forth that inward life to those who have not felt it. This white stone and new name is only known rightly by such as receive it. Now, though I had been thus strengthened to bear the cross, I still found myself in great danger, having many weaknesses attending me, and strong temptations to wrestle with, in the feeling whereof I frequently withdrew into private places, and often with tears besought the Lord to help me, and his gracious ear was open to my cry. All this time I lived with my parents, and wrought on the plantation, and having had schooling pretty well for a planter, I used to improve myself in winter evenings and other leisure times. Being now in the twenty-first year of my age, with my father's consent, I engaged with a man in much business as a shopkeeper and baker to tend shop and keep books. At home I had lived retired, and now, having a prospect of being much in the way of company, I felt frequent and fervent cries in my heart to God, the Father of mercies, that he would preserve me from all taint and corruption, that, in this more public employment, I might serve him, my gracious Redeemer, in that humility and self-denial which I had in a small degree exercised in a more private life. The man who employed me furnished a shop in Mount Holly, about five miles from my father's house, and six from his own, and there I lived alone and tended his shop. Shortly after my settlement here, I was visited by several young people, my former acquaintance, who supposed that vanities would be as agreeable to me now as ever. At these times I cried to the Lord in secret for wisdom and strength, for I felt myself encompassed with difficulties, and had fresh occasion to bewail the follies of times past, and contracting a familiarity with libertine people and as I had now left my father's house outwardly, I found my heavenly father to be merciful to me beyond what I can express. By day I was much amongst people, and had many trials to go through, but in the evenings I was mostly alone, and I may with thankfulness acknowledge that in those times the spirit of supplication was often poured upon me, under which I was frequently exercised, and felt my strength renewed. After a while, my former acquaintance gave over expecting me as one of their company, and I began to be known to some whose conversation was helpful to me. And now, as I had experienced the love of God through Jesus Christ to redeem me from many pollutions, and to be a succor to me through a sea of conflicts, with which no person was fully acquainted, and as my heart was often enlarged in this heavenly principle, I felt a tender compassion for the youth who remained entangled in snares like those which had entangled me. This love and tenderness increased, and my mind was strongly engaged for the good of my fellow creatures. I went to meetings in an awful frame of mind, and endeavored to be inwardly acquainted with the language of the true shepherd. One day, being under a strong exercise of spirit, I stood up and said some words in a meeting, but not keeping close to the divine opening, I said more than was required of me. Being soon sensible of my error, I was afflicted in mind some weeks without any light or comfort, even to that degree that I could not take satisfaction in anything. I remembered God, and was troubled, and in the depth of my distress he had pity upon me, and sent the Comforter. I then felt forgiveness for my offense, my mind became calm and quiet, and I was truly thankful to my gracious Redeemer for his mercies. About six weeks after this, feeling the spring of divine love opened, and a concern to speak, 
I said a few words in a meeting in which I found peace. Being thus humbled and disciplined under the cross, my understanding became more strengthened to distinguish the pure spirit which inwardly moves upon the heart, and which taught me to wait in silence sometimes many weeks together, until I felt that rise which prepares the creature to stand like a trumpet through which the Lord speaks to his flock. From an inward purifying and steadfast abiding under it springs a lively operative desire for the good of others. All the faithful are not called to the public ministry, but whoever are, are called to minister of that which they have tasted and handled spiritually. The outward modes of worship are various, but whenever any are true ministers of Jesus Christ, it is from the operation of his Spirit upon their hearts, first purifying them, and thus giving them a just sense of the conditions of others. This truth was early fixed in my mind, and I was taught to watch the pure opening, and to take heed lest, while I was standing to speak, my own will should get uppermost, and cause me to utter words from worldly wisdom, and depart from the channel of the true gospel ministry. In the management of my outward affairs, I may say with thankfulness, I found truth to be my support, and I was respected in my master's family, who came to live in Mount Holly within two years after my going there. In a few months after I came here, my master bought several Scotchman servants from on board a vessel and brought them to Mount Holly to sell, one of whom was taken sick and died. In the latter part of his sickness, being delirious, he used to curse and swear most sorrowfully, and the next night after his burial I was left to sleep alone in the chamber where he died. I perceived in me a timorousness. I knew, however, I had not injured the man, but assisted in taking care of him according to my capacity. I was not free to ask any one on that occasion to sleep with me. Nature was feeble, but every trial was a fresh incitement to give myself up wholly to the service of God, for I found no helper like him in times of trouble. About the twenty-third year of my age, I had many fresh and heavenly openings, in respect to the care and providence of the Almighty over his creatures in general, and over man as the most noble amongst those which are visible. And being clearly convinced in my judgment that to place my whole trust in God was best for me, I felt renewed engagements that in all things I might act on an inward principle of virtue, and pursue worldly business no further than as truth opened my way. About the time called Christmas, I observed many people, both in town and from the country, resorting to public houses and spending their time in drinking in vain sports, tending to corrupt one another, on which account I was much troubled. At one house in particular there was much disorder, and I believed it was a duty incumbent on me to speak to the master of that house. I considered I was young, and that several elderly friends in town had opportunity to see these things, but though I would gladly have been excused, yet I could not feel my mind clear. The exercise was heavy, and as I was reading what the Almighty said to Ezekiel, respecting his duty as a watchman, the matter was set home more clearly. With prayers and tears I besought the Lord for his assistance, and he, in loving kindness, gave me a resigned heart. At a suitable opportunity I went to the public house, and seeing the man amongst much company, I called him aside, and in the fear and dread of the Almighty expressed to him what rested on my mind. He took it kindly, and afterwards showed more regard to me than before. In a few years afterwards he died, middle-aged, and I often thought that had I neglected my duty in that case it would have given me great trouble, and I was humbly thankful to my gracious father, who had supported me herein. My employer, having a negro woman, sold her, and desired me to write a bill of sale, the man being waiting who bought her. The thing was sudden, and though I felt uneasy at the thoughts of writing an instrument of slavery for one of my fellow creatures, yet I remembered that I was hired by the year, that it was my master who directed me to do it, and that it was an elderly man, a member of our society, who bought her. So through weakness I gave way, and wrote it, but at the executing of it I was so afflicted in my mind that I said before my master and the friend that I believed slave-keeping to be a practice inconsistent with the Christian religion. This, in some degree, abated my uneasiness, yet, as often as I reflected seriously upon it, I thought I should have been clearer if I had desired to be excused from it as a thing against my conscience, for such it was. 
Some time after this, a young man of our society spoke to me to write a conveyance of a slave to him, he having lately taken a negro into his house. I told him I was not easy to write it, for though many of our meeting and in other places kept slaves, I still believed the practice was not right, and desired to be excused from the writing. I spoke to him in good will, and he told me that keeping slaves was not altogether agreeable to his mind, but that the slave being a gift made to his wife, he had accepted her. End of chapter 1. Recording by Devin Pertz, El Paso, Texas.